I have this raspy ass voice because I spent most of my high school and college screaming, yelling, wanting to have a voice. Hi, I'm Gracie Mercedes, and welcome back to Not Blank Enough, a podcast about everyday insecurities and triumphs. Today, I'm chatting with Jenny Yang, the Asian American writer, comedian, and activist, talks about migrating to America from Taiwan at age five, first generation guilt and being an overachiever, and how her activism led to her writing and comedy. All this and more in this episode we titled Not Powerful Enough. Hi, Jenny, and welcome to Not Blank Enough. Oh my goodness, I am so excited. (laughs) This is such a great concept. I love you. And I was like, dude, let's talk. Let's talk. We can jump right in. I need to know everything about you. Where are you from? What was your upbringing like? Just talk to me. I was born in Taiwan, uh, a a small island (laughs) off of mainland China. (laughs) And um, I moved to Los Angeles when I was five. Um, and I just grew up here. I had two older brothers, so I was like the most Americanized of my family. You know, I, I feel very fortunate that I grew up in Southern California because I was around people similar to me, which was cool. So you came when you were five. I didn't realize you were born in Taiwan. That's pretty cool. And did, did you speak English when you came here? No, I spoke Mandarin and Taiwanese because uh, I was raised by my grandmother who only spoke Japanese and Taiwanese. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I know. People don't know. People don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Colonization. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So my, my, my grandma raised me while my mom and dad worked until I was five. And then I came to the States and all I knew was Chinese and Taiwanese. And it, I feel like I have very vivid memories. I don't know if you have this experience, but I feel like a lot of immigrants or other people who had to move a lot, especially if you're young, for mm-hmm. me, it's like, it's already so traumatic that you remember stuff. So like, like other people, they're like, I don't remember anything before age six, you know, whatever. But I'm like, oh yeah, I remember when there was an earthquake in Taiwan when I was three and how my mom taught me things. And then when I was five, like what the plane trip was like and what it was like to see my dad again. And then you know, it was because yeah. he came He came a little before the rest of us. So you lived over there with your grandmother, but then when you came here, you were living with your parents? I was living with my parents, but my grandmother also lived with us, and oh, she raised it. me. Yeah. yeah so they were it's all one household. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And did grandma move with you guys? No, 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 no. She stayed grandma was very old. She stayed. I don't think it was ever an option. I think it was already stressful enough to like Mm-hmm. load three kids and the whole life, you know, cause my yeah. dad worked for an airlines and that's why we moved to LA um, um, okay. and to wanted to be close to LAX. That's why we all moved. But for sure, like I remember all these things from like around that time. And when you went to school, how is that like? I have memories of not understanding things for a while. Do they just throw you into school? Like yeah. without speaking oh, any yeah. English? Oh shit. Oh. My, I mean, my dad like knew kind of like book English, but he wasn't that good conversationally. Right. You know, like mm-hmm. he'll, he knew about the Greek myth of Achilles for some reason. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? He's like, do you know about Achilles? I was like, no, I'm five. You right, know? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you mean mm-hmm. Achilles heel later on? I'm like, oh, that's what that was. That's right. My mom was a garment worker and then she tried to take ESL in addition to cook and clean, like she straight up like did laundry by hand. Like she washed our laundry by hand oh and God. she didn't have energy to like go to ESL. You know what I mean? I would start to help her, but I started a little bit of kindergarten in, in LA, but mostly I have memories of first grade and being very confused. You know how we would like sing the sounds of the alphabet mm-hmm. and I'm like, what is this? I just would sing it. I was mesmerized by my like super blonde, like California beach babe, young teacher in the first grade. I remember just mesmerized by her blue eyes and like the freckles on her chest. I'm like, what is that? Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? Just like straight up like, oh, like they like white people were exotic to me, like so exotic. You know what I mean? Like they thought I was weird maybe, Mm -hmm. but they thought you were different, but Sure. You, but different. I mean, but then yeah. not even that different because I, gr- I I was in a neighborhood in an area that was like a lot of like brown, Asian, black folks, you know? So even Pacific Islander folks. So mm-hmm. but not speaking English, I would think would be so hard. I feel like school's hard enough, <laughs> like at that age when you're so young and kids are so mean. Like, like yes. how, does, how did you deal with that on like a daily basis? Like, do you remember you were so young? Oh, 
I mean, my main thing as a kid was I was like, I'm not, I'm not boy enough because I thought I was like, boys get everything. Like that was like a big, that was a big realization. We got to talk about that because that's so interesting. And no one said that before. Really? Yeah. Uh Like it's not, not like a gender identity thing. No, I know what you mean. Like you're not, I know you, I know what you're saying, but keep, keep going. Yeah. 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 It was like, you know, I have two older brothers. They were 10 and nine years older than me. You know, my dad is a very domineering personality for the household. And I just remember thinking to myself, I'm never listened to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And everyone else is telling me what to do. And then I'm here in America and all these little, little girls seem to be free as fuck. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm now I'm getting schooled, you know, with them. Um, Mm -hmm. and also it sounds like when, you know, people have low voices and they speak like with a period instead of a question mark at the end of what they say, they're listened to. And so, you know, there's a reason why I sang alto and not soprano. There's a reason why I have this raspy ass voice because I spent most of my high school and college screaming, yelling, wanting to have a voice, whether I was in pep band or volleyball as a Uh co-captain or, you know what I mean, cheering for school spirit or Mm -hmm. protesting. You know what I mean? So I don't know, like... I feel like, you know, when I was a kid, it was very, I I was kicking and screaming against puberty. I was, cause I was like, oh, girls are weak. Men are strong. They run things. Mm. Why can't I just do that? You know, like I didn't like my boobs were coming in for most of my adolescence. I like, um, I, my posture was hunched over. I wore baggy, you know, you know, sweatshirts. It was a whole thing. It was a whole body thing that I, it it took a while to undo, especially during college to be like, Mm. oh yeah, no, feminism says I should be proud of my body. (laughs) Okay. Right. You know? I'm just in like pleasant shock that this hasn't come up before because that's such an astute observation as a child to think, to be a little girl and be like, oh, the boys get paid attention to. Why don't I yes. get it paid attention? Oh my God. And I wonder if that's because you have two older brothers and I think so. dad and the family you, you brought up in. I love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like my brothers, cause you know, my brothers were punk ass unhappy kids who were immigrants at age 15, didn't know English and get, were getting beat up. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? And so they weren't happy. They definitely took that shit out on me. They definitely try to put me down in the ways that they could. And one of the ways that they could was the fact that I was a girl, right? And so they made fun of the fact that I was getting boobs. I felt ashamed of that, you know? They would make comments of uh, about uh, the women that we were watching television, uh, you know, uh, who were on television that we were right. watching together on. Like, there was just sort of this sort of low-grade kind of like misogynistic kind of harassment. <laughs> and uh, that was just permeating living at home with two teenage guys who felt disempowered by the world, you know? And so, and who did not do well in school at all. Like I was a total golden child because I was able to quickly learn English. And so because of all these reasons now looking back, obviously it doesn't forgive what they did, you know? And, and, you know, it was in college that I realized these things and actually confronted my brothers about the way that they would talk about women in front of me and said, don't ever do that in front of me again. And they just, they stopped, you know, and the power shifted because I became an adult, but like, When you're a kid and we're just trying to raise each other, you don't know what you're doing. Shit happens, you know? And so, yeah. And so I think, you know, I took that to heart. It was always like, oh, I'm not good enough, right? If I'm not a guy, I'm not a, I'm not boy enough. I'm not man, man enough. I'm not dude enough, you know? Um, I'm not, that means I'm not strong enough. I'm not powerful enough, you know? Ooh, yeah. I feel like powerful enough, especially is such a a great one because- that's really it. It's the power dynamic, right? And that's what feminism is. Yeah. I, you know, it's it's weird. I didn't quite feel that different racially until right. I got to college. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because you're mm-hmm. in a diverse neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt a little out of place in high school because every, all of my friends who were mostly Asian, East Asian American, in high school, we all became very obsessed with being popular. And I, I stopped I stopped caring as much by sophomore year. There was like a weird turn for me where I was like more obsessed with like some nerdy shit, whereas my friends were like trying to be like cool. Yeah. But everyone still saw us as a group. And right. so- So you're yeah. still part of the cool group, even though you didn't really feel 
No, 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 right. no. And then I was like internally, I was starting to ostracize myself and they were ostracizing me. What were you ostracizing yourself about? There was a big cheating scandal that happened with my friends. <laughs> what? I'll just get to it. There's Tell some me drama. More. <laughs> I have not. More. This is something my friends are like, you need to write about this. Basically, my friends and I were like A plus students. And you know, my, my two, my, my, me and my other friend, Sandy, were the, the two of our friend group that got the AAs. You know, for a while, like we would give answers to tests to our friends because we had that like algebra two or something first. Okay. Whereas they had the sec- just right. stuff like that. But right. so we started cheating a lot. Even though they like try to be good students, they like on the outside, they cared more about just kind of like maintaining looking like good students, but like not really doing the work. Right. When you say cheating, you weren't really cheating. Well, you were giving them answers though, right? Yes. Yes. So you, were, you weren't benefiting from the cheating. You were actually and helping. And then I stopped. Okay. Yes. By the end of sophomore year, I kind of got tired of it because I, I did a study abroad in Japan for the summer. And when I came back, I just sort of had a different perspective as you do when you travel that young Absolutely. Yeah. on like how immature or how like my values didn't align with my friends, which is that's a conversation you have when you're 15. Like, no. you're like your values do not align <laughs> with mine. You know what I mean? But it's amazing that you were aware of that at such a, at such a young age. Thanks. I mean, it's it made me weird, probably. You know, I always was sort of probably took my studies a little too seriously. I liked learning. You know, I did extra credit. All my friends were in student government. We had a we had the run of the school because of student council and stuff. I took that very seriously. Like, oh, maybe we should engage with more people rather than using it as a way to like lock other people out and be cool. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. So then at this time, what was that blank for you? What were you feeling not blank enough? Probably just not chill enough. It was like, I just, no chill. You know what I mean? I literally, I, in high school, I had no chill. I was like. No chill. I like that. We weren't very political. Like, you know, there's people who are like, in high school, I, we had like walk, like walkouts and, and protests and stuff. But no, like in high school, like we had a very active social high school. Like every month we had a, a, a school dance and we would sell out 700 Every tickets. month you had a school? Yes. Yes. Our student council, we met in fourth period leadership class where I we had our own building. I, by senior year, I was student body president. I had a gavel. I had my own office. Wait, when what you, school did you go to? This is a big public high school in Torrance. Wow. And so we had the run of the school and, and, and we had a weekly activities calendar that we ran. Every Friday was either a pep rally on the quad or an assembly that we would you know, uh, script and facilitate as student government. Like it was a lot of responsibility. I actually learned a lot of my leadership skills and like producing and event planning and writing skills in high school through student government, you know, that's so interesting. And it's such a, it sounds like such a Hollywood school. Like it sounds like a school yes. that you see on TV. <laughs> like, yes. No, we, we literally like, we sold out all the dance tickets, one dance every month. It was always popping. There was like photo booth. We always be like, people would pay to get that printed out oh my back God. in the day. You right. know what I mean? Like, right. and then by senior year, I, you know, I stopped um, cheating uh, or participating in the cheating um, and, and sort of socially kind of had the separation, yeah. but, um, it, it culminated with a bunch of my, my friends, um, stealing the master key and getting arrested and changing grades in the computer system. Oh, it's a whole damn. thing. Oh, it got real scandalous. That really should be written about. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> it was like, it was like evening news, like ABC, CVS, NBC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah like we for, were like real scandal. So then you went to college. Tell me about your college experience, because that's where you said you started to feel a little bit othered, I guess. Yes, a lot more othered. Um, You know, in in high school, it was more being othered because I had no chill. I took things so seriously, like school and like my student governance. Um, But I think what happened in college was I took leadership so seriously in high school, but I felt like the stakes weren't really that high. You know, it was social. But in college was when I finally realized, oh, leadership is a tool and you can use it for different purposes. And I figured out what my purpose was, which is having this sort of social consciousness, right? And social awareness of like, oh yeah, the world is unjust and there's oppression. And there's, these are all the different ways that sort of slice at our identities to make us not be able to live joyful, 
whole human lives. And so, right. um, yeah. And of course, college was also a great time to get the language to be, to be able to describe these feelings and like these things that are happening, like, you know, feeling oppressed as a young girl or seeing how my mom is treated or seeing how my family is treated out in public, you know, instead of high school feeling like that was just us, that was an, an us problem, a me problem going to college. I realized, Oh, other people experience this. And this is a, the world problem, you know? Yeah. And so it, it, college, I became very active as a student, um, in, in student politics. And what school did when, you go to? Was it not a very diverse? No. I, religion? so all my friends were like going to UC schools cause we grew up in California and I got into those schools, but I was also considering a bunch of these small liberal arts colleges that none of my friends cared about. Because there was this part of me that realized that I did take myself very seriously in terms of my schooling and all these other things. And so, you know, when my guidance counselor, who actually was someone who guided me, I know a lot of people didn't get that level of attention yeah. because of my student council work. Um, I had that relationship. She realized she's like, oh, your mom, your, you know, your, your, you get free lunch. You don't have that much money. You do excellent in school. You're going to get into good schools. By the way, did you know there's these other like super rich private schools who will pay you to go there? Right. And I was like, oh. Right. <laughs> what? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, so with that, you know, my parents didn't know anything about the, the college and education system out here. Yeah. So I just did my research and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And so I ended up going to Swarthmore. It's a smaller broads college outside of Philadelphia. It was like 1,400 students. It was wow. 70% really white, 70% white, which was my first time experiencing that. I'm like, uh -huh. what is what are, what are white people? Like <laughs> the white people wanted to be like us in yeah. my high school, right? you know? Yeah. Like in New York, I feel like New York City, there is that kind of vibe. Yeah, too it, it's funny. I My school was diverse in a different way. Like for my high school experience, it was mostly Latinx girls. Like it was just oh. like, it was yeah. 90% percent and i would say and then there's you know some african-american girls some asian girls maybe some white girl we had like maybe two white girls in our school um who were like the white girls who thought they were black white girls so yeah, like it was it, like it was just like yeah the typical white that you think of or see in, in on television the stereotypical no. i never saw that at least Same. not in high school yeah no not in real life in Oh, I went to NYU. Then it was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this <laughs> well, is what I saw on TV. <laughs> this is what I saw. Well, the white people. Um, and then for like younger education, the white people were Italian and, and, and Jewish and mostly Italian though, which to me is like, I know they're white, but it's like, there's like an ethnic white to them. Yeah, like where yeah. like a lot of them a are white like, ethnic. Yeah. Always, white ethnic. I always exactly. tell people, I love a white ethnic sometimes, you know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. they're very racist against me and sometimes totally. they're charming and mm -hmm. very interesting. So I'm yeah, like, okay. I think, I think Latin families and Italian families have a lot of similarities. One, like yeah. the way they, and they're usually Catholic and there's all that to, yes. you know, world into that. So yeah, it was a, just, just a different experience. Like once I got to college and then once I moved to LA, I felt like it was a whole nother experience. Cause that LA has its own type of racism separate from yes. New York's type of racism. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Oh, sure. So, so oh, yeah. yeah. Adjusting. I, to I, I, I feel like Swarthmore, I got, um, a huge dose of like people of color from New York influence. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it was on the East Coast and Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, and so that was like a huge like learning experience to be like, oh, this is what it was like to grow up mostly Latinx or black, you know, or even Asian American in the city. Right. Yeah. Um, and and it was just like it's just more in your face versus in L.A. It's just subtler and weird. And yeah, you know, I, I feel like too, L.A. has a way more diverse Asian population like in New York. Yes. I feel like I only knew Chinese people and like we uh -huh. only knew Chinese restaurants and you only like yep. and then out here I was like, oh, it's like Korean and Taiwanese. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, look, look at this, this variety of Asian, Japanese. And so it's like, oh, okay, that's refreshing. Like to be exposed <laughs> to more than one. Totally. And I yeah. feel like it's like, that's why it's like media would flatten things. You know what I mean? It's uh -huh. like, because most people just probably had that impression. Like I, I was like Dominicans. Puerto Ricans. What are those? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was like, yo, yeah, what? Yeah. What? Like I had all I said all of a sudden I had like a Dominican, Ecuadorian, Puerto Rican education, mostly New York based, you know. Yeah. Um, going to school at Swarthmore with my friends. And, and yeah. I was like, okay, okay, you can salsa this way. Okay, this is yes. another way to salsa. <laughs> 
What's merengue? merengue? <laughs> Just like Caribbean influence on the exactly. East Coast was really fun. And like, I, that's actually something I miss from my, from my sort of socializing time when I came back to LA after college. I was yeah. like, because we had through massive parties, massive for a smaller arts college. Like we were, we threw the funnest parties and it was very influenced by like a sort of a New York DJing brown aesthetic, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, and I on the, on the flip side of that out here in LA, I always feel like I miss that so much. I miss the Dominican Puerto Rican influence. There's, you know, a few of us here. <laughs> it's getting a little, <laughs> we're getting a little more of a population out here, but for sure when I first moved here, like 13 yeah. years ago, it was like nothing, nothing. I was just like, oh, wow, it's so interesting. <laughs> it makes sense. It's all about, you know, immigration and where people landed and ended up. But it's just so yeah. interesting how we only know what we grew up with, really, in, in a sense. Yeah. Pacific Rim versus Caribbean. I mean, anyway, I, I do miss eating um, the foods that you could just get like a casual plate of like rice and plantains and oh you know and stop whatever protein <laughs> i'm like mom can you ship me some food some stew some <laughs> stew let me get some of that stew looking thing so in college so what did you feel like your blank was in college then i was i was a lot of things in college I think the thing that was, I was a late bloomer in terms of my love life. <laughs> so I don't think I was romantic enough. I wasn't intimate enough. I was not, I was like very closed off. Does that make sense? I like, Absolutely. I think I like subsumed all of my erotic energy <laughs> into schoolwork <laughs> and uh -huh. activism. Uh-huh. Wow. And what a time to do that. <laughs> In college. college. Literally right. everyone is like, college is your time to while out. And I'm mm -hmm. like, no, this, this is my time to uh, learn how to do a phone tree or learn. <laughs> learn <laughs> I love that because that's so unique to be so hardcore at that age in that environment, you know? Listen, when you have to repress your emotions because of childhood trauma, then listen, you're not going to, it's going to develop on its own pace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and that touches with the whole like child of immigrant story, you know, where yes. you feel like you have to just succeed, survive, excel yeah. because of the struggles or because of the sacrifices your parents made to come here. For sure. There's this pressure. Yeah. Did you get that from your parents as well or did you just put it on yourself? They put it on me early, but I internalized it early. So they didn't really have to come back to that. Like <laughs> it was just already in me, you know? Mm -hmm. It was like my earliest memory of being in America was like seeing how hard my mom worked. Like I said, like seeing how it's like, oh, she is washing. I remember realizing that there were washing machines that existed. I was like, why are we not doing that? Why wow. is mom breaking her back? you know, like scrubbing our underwear every night after a long day of work, you know? And I remember one time I saw my mom uh, blow her nose into a Kleenex and, you know, it's gross because I'm five, but like I looked in before she closed it up and it was gray. And I remember being like, oh, mom, why is that gray? That looks weird, you know? And then her being like, oh, well, you know, there's this, I, I, I sew at this factory and there's not good ventilation. So this is why we came to America. This, this is her first time using that opportunity to say the same message over and over again, which was, this is why we came to America. This is why you're going to get an education and you're going to get A's and you're going to listen to your teachers because I never did that. And so you don't have to work this hard. I'm like, okay. Like five, you know, it's like, I just took it in and I just ran with it. I was like, okay. Cause she goes straight up. She's like, your job, like, you know how mom has a job and dad has a job. Like your job is to do well in school. I'm like, um, Okay. <laughs> okay, you know, don't we can't can't add a burden to uh, my parents. Uh -huh, I'm like uh -huh. five years old. <laughs> Girl, I get it. <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, no, yeah. it resonates. It totally resonates. I mean, my mom came here young. She was like five, um, and my dad yeah. was in his twenties when he came. They both went to New York. My mom also had me at sixteen, and my mom oh, and dad right. split up very young, and so she was a single mom. Working yeah. her butt off, getting her, you know, GT while working, while all this stuff. So I remember at a very young age being like, oh, mom's real busy. Like I need to make yeah. sure I take care of stuff. Now in therapy, I realized that <laughs> <laughs> three years of therapy, I realized um, you do in turn, like that's why I was such a good kid and that's why I got A's and that's why my room was always perfectly clean and my bed was made because there is this thing where you're like, oh, yeah. We don't have that privilege of just being like a shitty kid. 
<laughs> you know, you're just like, oh no, 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 no. I see kids now and I'm just like, oh, they're so spoiled. Yeah. I feel like I'm going to, if, if, and when I have kids, I'm just going to be probably more old fashioned than people think in terms of like, yeah, cause I a hundred percent had that feeling. I mean, it's, it, it can be a little traumatizing to take that on too much as a kid, but there is an element of like, oh no, we're not going to do that. You're contributing to this household by getting your shit together. You know, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Then so, there's a level so, of respect that comes with that. Like I, yes. I would never talk to my mother the way kids talk to their mothers today or like, it's I just know. mind blowing. I'm like, she birthed you. She pays for all this. You know what I mean? Like what? She carried you for nine months. <laughs> I know. When your legs, when your little legs got tired, she picked you up every uh-huh. time. <laughs> uh-huh. No, crazy. Yeah. Okay. So then after college, what was life like? And when did you decide you wanted to be a writer and a comedian? Well, my, my first career, it's, it's so funny. Like I call it a career, even though this, this comedy career is much longer now, but at the time it, it, it was a foregone conclusion for me to major in poli sci, major in policy. You know, I got a full ride to go to grad school in public policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to grad school at UCLA, you know, it was in my head. I was like, okay, I care about the world. I can never go back. You know, once you see the world a certain way, right, I feel like during 2016 Trump election, during all the George Floyd sort of Black Lives Matter stuff, these last few years made a lot of people awakened, right? And it's like, what do you do do with that? And and, and I felt that in college, like, oh, I see the world differently. And it, it, it forces you to take responsibility to be like, okay, what does that mean for your life now? You know, because you can't go back. You can't unlearn it. And so it, it, it was like so natural for me, like, okay, I'm going to work in politics or I'm going to work in some kind of movement. And so I worked for a nonprofit for like a year. I did this, I did grad school and then I worked for the labor movement. I worked for a public employees union that represented Southern California government workers, basically. Oh, wow. mm. So, you know, um, from nurses in county hospitals to beachcombers in our county beaches and trash collectors and janitors like that's what I did I was just burning away the good energy of my early 20s <laughs> just for the for the cause you know and I'm a I, I like to tell people I'm a recovering overachiever I'm like a, a recovering workaholic you know what I'm saying I was uh-huh. just like were you just I'm just always doing too much uh-huh. I am doing too much I need to dial it back and yeah. I always knew that in college because it was when it first hit me like oh okay this is if I don't fix this if I don't manage myself, I will burn out all the time and it will not be a happy life. And so, and I tried to do that, worked in the labor movement, felt myself burning out. And so instead of going to work and wanting to punch someone's face out, I was like, I need an outlet. I'm going to take a comedy class. So I took improv and I oh, took wow. stand up. But the thing is, is prior to that, um, what I don't tell people a lot is I used to perform poetry. What? <laughs> What? I know. See? Where? When? How? Well, I wrote it since I was in fifth grade, and I thought it was only something I could do for school or to share with my f- close friends on paper. And it, but it wasn't until college that I realized, oh, people perform poetry and sing and do this stuff together as a way of building community. And so that's what I did. I was like, okay. I, so I started doing that in college and I thought, okay, well that's college is over. That, you know, that's not, yeah. that's not something I'm going to do anymore. But I came back to LA and I quickly found this sort of community minded activist network of Asian Americans who are also creative, who put together this sort of open mic slash performance series that has been going for 22 years now. Oh, wow. What's it yeah. Called? It's called Tuesday night project, Tuesday night cafe in little Tokyo in downtown Los Angeles. And I, very quickly became one of their like associate artists and around town people were booking me as a, as a poet, like, Oh my God. For for Dia de los Muertos, you know, Uh at self-help graphics or whatever, like I've performed and I never called myself a poet. I didn't call myself a writer. I didn't take it seriously. It was something I did for fun. I would either make people cry or I'd make them laugh. I would never memorize it because I hated that. And then I realized, oh, I am a writer and I am creative and I need to take that seriously. So that's when I like took improv and stand-up classes. And how was that? <laughs> did it, it you was, instantly love it? Did you? Yeah, I was. it was so fun. 
Yeah. It was so fun. You know, like I, I was organizing at a, in the labor union and I was doing training and I was um, using storytelling to organize because that's what you do, right? You tell people stories of who you are in order to get them on board. And, and, and that was a form of creativity. But, you know, it's much different to be able to perform as a stand-up comedian representing your own ideas, right? Versus needing to prepare testimony for a member leader to give give at a hearing, you know, and represent an entire membership of 85,000 members, right? So they both sound you know. intimidating and scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so that's what happened. I, um, I, I started and I just kept going because I was like, oh, this is really, it could be really powerful. And I like that instant connection and gratification that I would used to get performing poetry pretty regularly, you know? Do you still do poetry or no? No, not at all. I, really? Okay, you just like, like dropped it? I did, but I think um, there's times when I feel inspired to wanting to write some stuff. Um, I think Twitter became that a little bit sometimes, but not really. It's not really that poetic. I remember when I started comedy, and I know how you feel because I know you write. I knew that when I started stand-up that it was so hard that I was like, okay, I know I will have achieved something when I can perform stand-up and write stand-up, and it will feel like that direct line I have when I'm able to write poetry, you know, from my heart and my head into my hands, you know, onto the paper, you know? And yeah. so I, I, I have yet to feel that feeling for but, comedy, for comedy, but I'm excited to pers- ch- chase that high. <laughs> <laughs> and today, how is yeah. Jenny feeling? What are you doing? What are you up to? And what's your blank now? With all the political stuff happening, I feel like, um, you know, my background in politics has helped me a lot to kind of make sense of the world as a comedian. And that's been helpful. But I think even prior to the pandemic, I was, you know, still kind of learning my lessons about burnout, you know, and I think I think a lot of what I'm focused on nowadays is yes, like I still want to be ambitious and do fun things. So much of it was like, you know, I was not resting enough. (laughs) So still not chill enough. (laughs) <laughs> no, I know, right? No, I am more I am definitely way more chill now. Like so I would say right before the pandemic, I was like not chill enough, so I took like a year off in my head, like where I was like, "Oh, I actually have But you say you take a year to off. Take a but weren't you like writing on a show and don't don't you do like a million things? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I took a year off in terms of my stuff, but I wrote I wrote Got on it. a TV show, Last Man Standing. Okay. Uh, and we just wrapped the second season of it for me. Um, and the whole series actually. So I think the right now, my thing is feeling, I'm not thinking about not being enough in a certain way right now, which is kind of good, right? I don't know. I'm constantly fighting back the feeling of I'm not doing enough, right? Whether that's in sort of speaking out about something because of some, uh, you know, name your atrocity that's been happening in the world. Especially right? lately, yes. Right. I think maybe part of that is that the world's so overwhelming sometimes that you feel like, how could you possibly be doing enough? No, no one's doing enough. Yeah. No one's, and and no one ever could do enough to, to never. That's what it feels like. The big lesson I learned in college was like, if, if if this is going to be a life, a good life, I'm going to have to run the marathon and not the sprint, which is a, a lesson I learned early on from another activist that was older than me. And I was like, okay, yeah, I need to, I definitely need to like think on this regularly. We're no good when we're spent, you know, we're no good to anyone, much less ourselves. So yeah, not yeah. rested enough almost too. Like we don't, we don't, give we don't rest enough. Oh yeah. my God. I spent, I spent the last three years taking more baths than I ever have. <laughs> you know, I was already ready. I was already not doing most of my stuff other than my day job. Like literally I cut everything else out for the year before the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, I was actually raring to go. I was like, 2020 is my year. Yeah, I got plans. Of I'm about to, I'm about to write and produce my own short films. Uh-huh. This is, we're going to do all these things. And then uh-huh. it was like, nope. Nope. I was like, oh, I guess I'm just going to have to mourn that for a second and then just go back to what I was doing. And and it was like, oh, okay, this is nice. This is nice to just like enjoy open-ended time. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, love it. Okay, well, Jenny, <laughs> uh, what would you like to call this episode then after all that? I don't know. I don't have to call it anything. You can choose. There is something to your like. Like not being powerful enough? Yeah. That, maybe like, maybe it's powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I yeah, think that, it, that encapsulates it. Yes. I feel like that encapsulates <laughs> the whole like experience of all of it from being a child <laughs> immigrant to having these older brothers to being like 
feeling like you have to overachieve to wanting to fight for people's rights. Yes. Yeah. Power. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Jenny. Not powerful yes. enough. We got there. <laughs> we got there. Um, I love it. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. This was so much fun. How can oh people my gosh. find you? Um, they can find me at jennyyang.tv or at jennyyangtv everywhere. Instagram, uh, Twitter is my main poison. Uh, J e n n y y a n g t v. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. I'm gonna log off now. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Not Blank Enough with me, Gracie Mercedes. You can find out more about today's guest in the show notes. Please subscribe to Not Blank Enough wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Instagram at notblankenoughpod. If you like what you hear, please also consider a rate and review. Our show today was executive produced by Gracie Mercedes and Dave Hill and produced by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Not Blank Enough is a Gumption Pictures production.